playing here is just a picture of the empty tomb and Jesus having resurrection power that not only did he just obtain because he wears the victor's crown, but guess what? He takes that resurrection power and he places it in us when we receive him. That means you have the greater one in you and if God be for you, who can be against you? What can be against you? Nothing can be against you. That's why we're studying Psalm 91. That's totally what it's all about, is just how wonderful and great our God is. And you know what else he is? He is a way maker, miracle worker. There is nothing, promise keeper. I just have to type that in, right? Um, there is nothing that he will not do. Miracles are still in the in the in his possession and miracles live inside of you. Amen. So I want you to continue worshiping the way maker that lives inside of us. Whatever you're facing today, whatever didn't go so great this week, whatever you're frustrated about today, you know what? We gotta get in that secret place that we were talking about two weeks ago. And when we're in that secret place, all of heaven comes on your behalf and fights for you. You have angel armies on your side. Amen? So let's worship our way maker. Let's worship him.
I just love it because it is such a amazing and beautiful visualization and auditory remembrance of our God. He even when I love the part when she begins to repeat over and over, even when I can't see that you're working, even when I can't feel that you're working. And anybody ever been in this situation where <laughs> See, he was working, they couldn't feel he was working. But you know what? I love when she just chimes in and says, you never stop working. It doesn't matter what we see or what we feel. He's a supernatural God. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. And he is on your side. He wants you to be victorious. He wants you to be more than a conqueror. He wants you to triumph in and about all things. And that's why we've gathered in the parking lot this Sunday, isn't it? To just receive even more of his words so that our faith can come alive and escalate so that our faith actually has action in this earth you know your faith is alive your faith is the currency of heaven that when you take the word and you apply your faith to it all of heaven backs you up all of heaven because his word never fails his word is perfect in fact, the, the Bible tells us that throughout all eternity, though heaven and earth will pass away, his word will endure forever. And though the flower fadeth and the earth pass, his word is eternal. And that's why we come here. We come because we want to be built up. We want to, we want to get that living organism in us so that the flesh can die off and more of Jesus, our way maker, miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness can shine like never 
before and especially in these days that we live in. And if that is your confession and your belief too, would you just shout amen from your horn? That's the only thing you can do at this point. Well, good afternoon, everyone. How is the Jesus parking lot believers doing today on this day? Amen. You all got smiles on your face. I'm glad for that. I can see in the windshield, those of you that are watching on Facebook Live, or maybe you're going to get a CD or someone's going to share this with you, I can't see you. But that applies to you. Even when I can't see you, he's working in your life also. So um, I hope you're enjoying this gorgeous weekend. Wow. We went from 30, as Pastor Luis said last weekend, to this amazing, amazing, just glorious weekend. Um, I hope you got out and got some fresh air and um, just got to see God's creation blooming all over the place. And again, he's working. You don't see the flower bloom, do you? No, you go out one day and you see a little bud and next day the bud's a little bigger. And sometimes overnight you go out and boom, there's a flower in bloom. And that's the way it is in your life too. He's working behind the scenes in a way that only he can. Amen. So before we get started, just a few announcements for us to go over today. Um, and so some of them are a little bit new, so you might want to think, oh, well, I've heard these before, but you might not have heard a couple of these. Um, first one is because of the date change, we had an absolute full bus. 56 passengers were going to Sight and Sound to see the production of Esther. And because of what's happening, um, that is about to change in Jesus' name, right? Um, the trip was um, postponed to August. August 11th is a new date. That's a Tuesday. And because some of those that were able to go in June, for whatever reason, cannot attend in August. So we have a few seats that have opened up. We had a pretty lengthy waiting list. We fulfilled that. So if you were kind of just, oh, darn, I didn't think that would fill up that quick. Well, there's a couple seats open. Um, if you would just go ahead and, and email the ministry at info at deborahgroverministries.com. We'll get in touch with you and we'll work out what we need to do to go ahead and get you on the bus. Just know we will need um, a $50 deposit um, within the next week or so. And then the balance is going to be due for the trip on June 15th. Second thing, Psalm 91 is where we're at, right? P91. So last week, Marge did a wonderful job of making these bookmarks because we're on a mission to not just learn Psalm 91, we're on a mission to memorize it, to get it in our heart so that when we see things happen before us, we're not speaking fear. We're not speaking unbelief. We're speaking the word. Amen. So if you did not receive one of these, I'm trying to think how we should do this. Um, we will see you at the close of the service when we receive your tithe and your offering. We'll have some extras right out here to go ahead and distribute with you. So this is the whole Psalm 91. We broke it down into two verses per little paragraph, and that will assist you in um, learning some things about that. Um, next thing I want to make mention is that um, if you have, and I taught Psalm 91 about 11 years ago, and a CD popped up from somewhere, and I had recorded that CD to, to um, encourage you to memorize it and to do it a little at a time, just to put it in your car, wherever you're out in your car, you put that CD and get that Psalm 91 in you. If any of you who have been with me for so very long, if you still have that CD, can you please get in touch with me because I wanna make a whole bunch of us then repeat that for all of us to have here in the parking lot. Believe them, we're gonna be in the church soon and very soon. Amen, that's what my belief system is. Um, next thing, Relentless Tea. Um, that is September 26th. That also was changed from May 16th. Um, listen, there are women still buying tickets. So I want to caution you that our room will only hold a certain amount of women for this day in September. And I'm having kind of a feeling that we're going to have to be a little socially distant even when September comes. So don't put off getting your ticket because we're probably not going to have the ability to just take on whoever wants to go at the last minute. So you can go ahead and uh, go on to relentlesswomensconference.com. That is the women's ministry website, Relentless Women's Min relentlesswomensconference.com. And you'll see how you can go ahead and get your tea ticket online. Speaking of relentless, see a lot of these things are new. This Tuesday at seven o'clock, you want to mark your calendar. 
because we're having our first ever, first ever Relentless Women Overcoming Together live. It's going to be all the leaders from Relentless and we're going to talk about um, what the season is like and just some, I think, really applicable things you can put into your life. Um, we're going to talk about the conferences this year and how God's timing was so perfect to call us into this place called Going Deeper. Wow, little did we know we would not only be taught that, but we would actually have to go deeper and take some of these precepts and put them into play in our life. So this Tuesday, 7 o'clock, on the Relentless Facebook page, we are going to go live in something which will be first of many called Women, Relentless Women Overcoming Together. Okay, so that's that. Lastly, our giving platforms, just to repeat that, I've done that every week. Again, thank you so much for your consistent and continual desire to see the word go forth and, and sowing into your own discipleship. The three platforms to give are to go onto our website, covenantmessiah.com, covenantmessiah.com, and you can see a little link there for giving. You can also give by text. That number is 856 997 Two three zero three eight five six nine nine seven two three zero three, or the good old fashioned snail mail way, uh, which is P O box five six eight zero, and that's in Deptford. And all that information also is on our website. So let's take a moment um, and let's pray. Pray for the offering that will come this week. Pray for your mind to be renewed today and for my tongue to be yielded to the Lord so you can do all those things. Amen. Why don't you Lord, we come into your amazing presence and we, we stand here and we confess you are King. You are Lord. There is nothing greater than you. There is no one greater than you. There's no force greater than you, God. You are a great God. You're an awesome God. You're an amazing God. And you're one, Lord, that always desires your people to go forward. You are not a God of minuses and division. You're a God of multiplication and addition. And so, Lord, we thank you for this gathering today. I thank you, Lord, for the weeks. This is our ninth week here. And you have held back the clouds. You've held back the rain. You've held back so many things that your plans and purposes would be accomplished here in this parking lot. I give you thanks for my family who's gathered in the middle of a Sunday afternoon, uh, no matter what the conditions were, and they have desired however way they saw fit, Lord, to hear your word. And so God, now I just yield myself over to you that your people would leave different from this parking lot than they came. I pray that faith would arise as the word is infused and infiltrated, renew our mind, God. We don't want to be conformed to this world. We want to be transformed. And we know that that can only happen by the renewing of our mind. So we confess loudly. We confess over our mind that it's alert to hear. We thank you that no force or foe can come against this word today. No force or foe can come against the offerings that your people will sow. We stand on the promise that as we give in accordance to what you've told us in Malachi, that you will rebuke the devourer for our name's sake and you'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a very blessing that only you can pour out and that we cannot contain. So we just worship you right now. We continue psalms in our heart, spiritual psalms, in our lives, Lord, and we thank you for this psalm, Psalm 91. Moses wrote this from experience as he wandered a wilderness time where there was danger, where there was foes, where there was ice everywhere he looked. And yet he knows from experience that Psalm 91 was his guiding force <coughs> through the desert, God. And may it be ours also. In Jesus' precious name, and the church said, <laughs> Okay, so, I think my throat is all set now. <clears throat> so far, we have unraveled, haven't we, verses 1 and 2 of this amazing chapter. Listen, when, you, when you're putting to a decision to memorize this, you should, you should be so thankful you're actually memorizing a chapter in the Bible, not just a verse anymore. 
and we've already memorized Psalm 23. It's only a few more verses to add to the to the epitaph, Lord, of what needs to take place. So you're going to memorize a whole chapter. And we unraveled these first two verses last week. Again, I can't encourage you enough to memorize this. Listen, you have got nothing better to do. <laughs> I know you're home, right? Take this with you. I, I want to, again, I can't emphasize, if you're watching on Facebook Live or you're in this parking lot and you have that Psalm 91 CD, I would love to hear from you so that we can redistribute that and get this word so deep in our hearts. Um, I'm in the process, again, like you, of going back over it again and renewing it in my mind, placing it in my heart. But in the meantime, I hope like like myself that you're you're keeping on the task of praying and speaking the word over this crazy time that we find ourselves in in our life right now. What a time this is, but I have to tell you it wasn't it didn't surprise God. Uh, he's not the author of it, but he sure will be the finisher of it because he's the author and the finisher of our faith, not disaster. Amen. So in fact, in speaking of what we say we talked last week about what we say the importance of our tongue and i hope that you have if you were here last week in the parking lot unfortunately our camera went down and the recording did not take so those in the parking lot got an extra special 10 minutes of what i think was imperative point in our message last week and that was in fact we called the message stick your tongue out at god you think oh my goodness how irreverent is that? No, God wants to inspect our tongues. Just like you go to a doctor when you're not feeling well and things aren't going good in your life and you make an appointment to see the doctor and one of the first things he does when he sits you down the examining table is he says, stick out your tongue. Because our tongues tell us something about the body. And Jesus is the head of the body. And by looking at our tongues, he can inspect the welfare and the health of our body. So I hope that you've been doing all that this week. It's okay to stick your tongue out at God when it's for the for the, the, the desire for him to inspect that. Our words matter. They're containers of power. We said last week that life and death is in the power of the tongue, but that's not where the verse ends in, in Proverbs 18. It goes on to say, and we will surely eat the fruit of it. What does that mean? It means you're going to have what you say. What you say is going to be the fruit of your life. And we talked about James. James says our tongue is like the rudder of a ship. That if you if you don't like the direction your life's going in, if you're reading the word of God and you say, well, gee, I know God's not a respecter of persons. I know that he's faithful to all his children. He doesn't have any favorites. So why is his life like that and mine like this? Well, maybe he or she has ordered their tongue in a right way that the rudder of that ship is guiding them into progressive, prosperous, healthy waters. Our tongues are that important that we have revelation on that. So part of learning Psalm 91 is working on getting our math saved. Now you might be in the parking lot or those of you that are watching on Facebook Live and you say, well, gee, I'm saved. Well, you might be saved, but I'm asking if your tongue's saved. <coughs> Is your tongue saved is the question. Are you guarding your heart? Am I guarding my heart in the secret place? That was verses one and two that we looked at, okay? So I want us to together look at Psalm 91, verse one and two. And we're gonna read it together. So go ahead and get your bookmark out. <coughs> if you don't have a bookmark, you will have one. Open up your Bible. Or you can just follow along with us. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 2, I will say of the Lord. This is what we spent time talking about last week. I will say of the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him I trust. So now I want you to close your eyes. Or not even close your eyes, but maybe just look up a little. And by, by heart do that. Memorize that. Say that by heart. Let's do that together. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him 
I will trust. That's how we're gonna do this. Week after week, we're gonna get two down, we're gonna add another one. We're gonna get a three down, we're gonna add another one, and we're just gonna slowly build up to it. If whoever your neighbor is in your car, I want you to touch them right now and say, you're awesome. And you know what? If no one's in your car, Jesus is with you. Tell him he's awesome. All right? That's okay, too. So, verses 1 and 2 are the beginning of the chapter. Now, catch this. Because they set the path for the rest of the psalm. See, they're not just there any old way. We have to understand that the Lord and his sovereignty and his omniscience and his omnipotence, these verses are placed in a way on purpose. There's something to learn by that. And this is so true in the psalm. Verse 1 and 2 are the beginning of the chapter because they, again, set the path. They set the progress for the, for the rest of the psalm. In other words, when we lodge and we live and we remain in the secret place, in an attitude of obedience and praise and worship, and when we say of the Lord, see, when you're guiding and being and residing with him in that secret place, you're going to say of the Lord. Because when you're in that secret place with him, you find out deeper things about him, right? And as soon as you find out the deeper things about him, we say what we know. We don't say what we don't know. Out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. So when we spend that time with him in obedience, in praise, in worship, we took some covenant names of God apart. We looked at El Elyon and we looked at El Shaddai. He's more than enough, right? When you find that out, and you can only find that out by the secret place. You will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Not your mother's God, not your father's God, not grandmom's God, but in my God I will trust. Or, or, do you see that? So because a person, a person who lives in the secret place is a person who speaks faith. You're not going to speak unbelief. If you're truly abiding and living in the secret place. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Covenant, directions and ordinances and structure and principles of the very church that we, we just so cherish. You know, a thing that God said the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. Well, Paul, he quoted Deuteronomy chapter 30 when he spoke this in Romans 10, 8. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth the word of faith that we preach the word is nigh thee even in thy mouth the word of faith that we preach see first of all our mind needs to be renewed that's the first thing that needs to happen because because the word tells us that where the man goes where the mind goes the man follows okay the mind the mind is the first thing that needs to be renewed why why does the lord want our mind renewed just so we can think god's thoughts no he knows that if our mind is renewed then what's going to happen is that it's going to overflow and it's going to get into our heart it's going to get into our heart as a man thinks so is he and when it gets into our heart the Bible goes on to another verse that we looked at last week and says what? Out of the overflow of the heart, what speaks? Somebody tell me. The mouth. So see, what God's really after is, yes, the mind needs to be there. Yes, the heart needs to have that in there. But ultimately, he's after your words. He's after your words. Jesus himself said in Mark 11, you can, you can say to the mountain, move if you believe, and it will be moved. Jesus himself, when he was tempted in the Mount of, of Temptation, in the accounts of the Gospels that we read, he didn't think something. Of course he had in his heart that, that God is ruling and Satan had no rule over him. But until Jesus said it, what did Jesus say? It is written. It is written. And I'm going to tell you something. Satan's after your words, too. God's after your words and Satan's after your words because he knows that what we say we have. So it's kind of a snare there that he puts us through to kind of get our words, if you know what I'm saying. So first, our not mind needs to be renewed so we can get into our heart so that ultimately that heart will overflow and we will speak. I was, I was just brought to remembrance yesterday that 
several years ago, I guess we would say it probably is uh, 12 years ago now, um, our daughter, Melissa, who just had her first baby, a lovely little, amazing little girl, I will say, um, she um, went to college in West Palm Beach, Florida, a place called Palm Beach Atlantic. And um, so the day that she was to, you know, check into school and whatnot, Ray and I obviously we took a plane to take her there and help her get in that first day and whatnot. And as so it would be that day, there was a massive hurricane that was down in the Floridian area and coming in the Gulf area, which is, you know, kind of where she was. So bad hurricane. And in fact, they were canceling flights left and right. So we were praising God that they did not cancel the flight that we were taking to West Palm that day. And we get on the plane and everything was great. And she was in the middle, right? It was on one side, I was on the other. And we started getting close to West Palm Beach. And I'm telling you, you want to talk about some rocking and rolling on the plane. It was certainly happening. And, you know, put the seatbelt on and the stewardess is sitting down. And, you know, you just watch things and you just know there's conversations taking place that you're not privy to. And we're, we're probably a good half hour away from there. And anyway, it just was, it was a bad, bad descent, and it was a bad flight. And they warned us that it was just going to be really bumpy and have your seatbelts tight and this and that. And I just had this psalm. This psalm is just in my heart and just quoted that. I was praying in tongues. It was, it was so bad that my daughter, our daughter, actually um, had a little stomach up chuck, let's put it that way on the plane, and so did many others. It was nasty. And we were going down, and we found out later that we were the last flight going into West Palm that day. They had canceled every other flight after that. And as we were descending, you could barely see the runway, barely see it, but we saw enough to know that we were close by. Well, we, we start going down, and the wings are just moving right and left. I don't know if we're landing on our sides or what's gonna happen. Well, we get down to just about touchdown and all of a sudden the pilot just pulls the throttle up and just goes back up and ascends back up in the air and then later on he had said once we got down safely um he had said that the, the, there was just this gust of wind and the runway was just unapproachable and unseeable what am i saying i'm saying this this is when you need the word of god see it's no you're not going to have time to take out a concordance and find out a uh, messages on fear you're not gonna have time to do that you you are going to say what is in you what's in you is going to come out when you're squeezed amen how many times have we talked about that and so I, I want you to know that that this lady here I had the faith audacity the faith audacity to believe that confessing this song and speaking in tongues I had the faith to believe that God would so honor that word, which he did, I'm here, aren't I? That not only was my family saved from some tragic situation and myself, but the whole plane was saved. See, you got to consider the word for other people. Amen. The word isn't just for only, only for you. The word is for victory, for, for Jesus to be shown forth with signs and wonders. How are they going to see signs and wonders when you're scareder than they are? Amen? Well, I don't know about that, Pastor Deb. I mean, really, the whole plane, you really do have some faith audacity. Listen, that's what Acts 16 is all about. Paul and Silas had a bad couple days down in the heart and center of the prison. But you know what? They got in their secret place. They praise God anyway. They worship God anyway. And you know what? The jail cells opened up. The locks came undone. But it wasn't just for them. The whole jail situation. And the jailer got saved and probably everybody else in the jail. Because the manifestation of Jesus was shown forth in their character, in their perspective, in the real who they are character. It was shown forth. Are you seeing that? Yes. So this man... This man in Psalm 91 is not only trusting God, he's speaking faith words. Because, again, I can't emphasize enough, if you're really trusting God, that is what's going to come out. 
Because whatever you really believe is what we're going to say, what we're going to talk about. Everyone, faith is released into the natural by words. It doesn't, oh, I'm a, I'm a woman of faith. I'm a man of faith. Oh, we're a faith church. Well, let me hear what you're saying. Because that's how things change in the natural, by faith-filled words. That's why God wants your tongue. That's why it's important that we every day stick our tongue out at God and let him examine it so that what we say is what he says. That's the beginning mark of a true follower. I'm with you. I'm not there every day. I'm not saying I am. I know you're not either, but you're here today. I'm here with you. You're here with me. Let's, let's, let's go forward with this. Let's be better at this next week than we were this week at it. Amen? Faith has to be in our heart and in our mouth. It can't just be in our heart. Well, you know, God knows my heart. He may know your heart, honey, but until you say it, nothing in the natural is going to change. Are you with me? Paul even said, as it has to do with salvation, Paul said, in order to be saved, you have to do two things. You have to believe and you have to confess. I am so sorry, but there are churches that have all these undercover believers who quietly pray. Okay, and, and, and nobody look because we don't want anybody to know they just became a Christian. When the Word of God says we have to examine the fruit of each other to find out if we really are believers. <laughs> church is telling people, we, we, nobody can know this. It's between you and God. No, Christianity is a public, that's what baptism is all about. It's going public. Lord, you know undercover Christianity. Hmm. Hmm. Well, here's what Paul says. Paul said this what I'm saying. He says this in Romans 9. If thou will confess with thy mouth, if thou will confess with thy mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. Why? Why? Because words translate us from one kingdom to the next. Words have power. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. So this man in Psalm 91, right, is not only trusting God with his whole heart, but he's speaking. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And guess what? Here's where I want to take us today. And for the rest of the time we'll be together in the weeks that come. The rest of the psalm now becomes his benefit. That's what I want you to see. That's why verse 1 and 2 are where they are. Because when that's in place, then we see the God part take place. Listen, there's a manward part and there's a God part. Grace is certainly God doing everything. There's no doubt about it. But we still have to have faith. He gives us a measure of it, Romans says. But faith will grow by hearing and hearing by the word. That's, what ha that's what's happening in the parking lot today. Amen? And so, guess what? When we put these two things in operation, the rest of Psalm 91 becomes the benefit of us doing the first two verses. Such an important thing for you to see. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. When we do that, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. He's only saying what he's living. That's all. He's just not blabbing and grabbing. He's, he's saying who he really is and what he's really believing. Now, let's look at verse 3. We can finally move on a little bit. Are you ready to see verse 3? Now, remember what I said. Verse 1 and 2, they're the part that when we put that in place, now we see God pouring benefits of this psalm in our life. And verse 3 says this, surely he will deliver you. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. We just went from what we're doing to now what God's doing. Do you see where that transition's taking place? Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the purulous pestilence. 
Let's take a minute right there and look at that. There it is. Here is where the psalm moves away from our part to God's part. Okay? And I love the amplified version of Psalm 91. Listen to the amplified version. It's wonderful. It says in verse 3, For then, for then he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from deadly pestilence. For then. For what? For when the first two verses are in operation. That's for then. I love how the Amplified puts that. For then he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. We need that word happening today, church, in our lives, don't we? Last I checked, there's a little bit of deadly pestilence around us. Satan's even given it a name. It's here. But guess what? God, long before COVID-19 ever showed up on the news, God had the good news about it already delivered, already planned ahead, already figured out, already an answer for our dilemma. He always does. He always has that, always has that prepared for us ahead of time. Amen? Do you see that? So, so I'm, I'm thankful that he's our deliverer. Surely he will deliver you from the, from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. I'm so glad, aren't you? We have the deliverer who lives inside of us. So let's take a little closer look at what does he deliver us from? I mean, is it from everything? Is it from certain things? This is worth investigating a little further in the weeks and re the remaining of today that we're gonna look at. The first thing it says that he delivers us from, surely, is the snare of the fowler. Isn't that interesting? And if you're following me, those of you on Facebook Live too, or on CD, or, or, or those that, that I'm present with right now, if you, if you remember what I said, these verses are in order. There's a reason that they're verse number three is verse number three, and verse number one is verse number one. And right off the bat, the first thing he's going to tell us is that we're delivered from the snare of the fowler. So I want to know what that is, because if that's one of the first things that he lists, as a delivering power in our lives, I want to understand that. I want to just tell you something so amazing. When I first found this out many years ago, it was it was so confounding to me and so amazing. And I'm sure for some of you who have never heard it, you'll feel the same way. A fowler is simply a bird catcher. It's a bird trapper, like a hunter, only a hunter for birds. It's interesting, isn't it? So when Moses says here, surely he will deliver you from a snare or a trap of the fowler, it means there's an enemy out there that desires to trap you. There's, there, there's, a, there's a bird catcher, if you will, out there that desires to get you in his snare and to trap you. Peter says, we have an adversary who roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour, which tells me he can't just devour any old buddy. He's seeking who it can be. Who does this bird catcher get into a snare? Only those he can snare and capture can he devour. His name is Satan, and he is your enemy. He is our enemy. He is, he is, is, he's the enemy of the church, and he's the enemy of Christ. And every enemy you think you have, this big enemy is behind those little enemies. He's the epitome of enemies. Because we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with principalities, powers, and rulers in high places. Okay? So whatever's coming at us in flesh and blood, he's behind that. He has snared that person. He has captured that person to do his bidding, if you will. Uh, okay? Are you with me now? Yeah. We could take a detour right here. Oh, my, my, my. And I almost did. We could take a detour here for the next several weeks to talk about the kind of snares, the kind of catches that this bird catcher wants to get you in. Things like you can be snared because of your feelings. You can be snared by the fowler because of pride. Oh, pride. Pride is one of the biggest snares there are. Why? Because the Lord speaks about pride. He says that he resists it. He will resist pride, but he'll give grace to the humble. 
That means you can make a mistake every five minutes. But if you're humble, God will give you grace in it. But if you cover and you cover and you cover. See, that's what they did in the garden. They covered. They went undercover and they covered themselves. And to this day, people, Christians, church people, they take their sin and they try to hide it. And it's all because pride is covering it. Oh, that's a big one that Satan wants to use to snare us, is pride. Money. He can use money. The fear of not having enough. People work themselves to death sometimes, okay? It's a snare. Because if we're really doing what God says with our money, then we just, we exchange us having to provide for us and we give God the Jehovah Jireh title that he's already desired to be our provider. Amen? Fear. Fear's another snare. Fear is a big snare because fear is a master spirit of the failure. With fear comes a whole bunch of fear's family members. Doubt and unbelief and panic and depression and anxiety. The word tells us in Proverbs that anxiety actually leads to depression. It's a forerunner of it. Another snare that we, that we can look at is success. That we have such low self-esteem we have low self-worth that we think what we do will make us a something-something. But see, when we find out what God says about us, when our identity is in Christ, and we find out that we're a royal priesthood and a chosen generation, and that we're more than conquerors, and that he's, he's already seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When we find out those things, see, it's rest. Because we don't have to work to be somebody. He will make you somebody. How many times have we shared this from this pulpit? That out in um, the Philippi, out in uh, Caesarea Philippi, when we've been to Israel, I can't believe we were in Israel one year ago today. It feels like so long ago. We were just there last year. But we take people to Caesarea Philippi, and it's where Jesus said to them, Who do men say that I am? And the disciples were there. Well, some say you're Elisha, some say you're Isaiah. You know, well, who do you say I am? See, it matters who you say. And once again, he says, who do you say I am? Not what you believe. Are you saying it? And of course, you know, Peter steps up to the plate and he says, basically in the Greek, what he said is you're Yahweh. He called him God. And what did Jesus say? Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And now, Peter, I'm going to call you this. See, when we find out who Jesus is, then we find out who we are. But so many believers spend their life trying to be somebody, trying to, to be successful, to have a name for themselves, to have a position for themselves, only to find it doesn't satisfy. There are going to be people, church, in heaven who on this earth never had a title. There are going to be people in heaven who, are, who we are going to see that are going to be exalted by the Lord because of what they did in secret. Because what did Jesus say? What you do in secret, I'll reward you. Amen? So again, there's so many of these things. Self-worth is a snare. But, but there's so many we could just spend every week going over one of these. But the one that I want to talk about today for the next few minutes is one that, that the fowler uses that kind of sets the pace for all the others. See, the fowler, the bird catcher, he doesn't initially kill his prey. He's patient. He's very slow. He's very watchful. He has a distinct mode of operation. All bird fowlers use this. It's something we can learn about. His greatest advantage for trapping is watching. He watches. He watches the bird's habits. He watches when it gets up, when it goes down, what it does, how what it doesn't do. Knowing what the bird will do next before the bird does it in a specific set of circumstances. In other words, the fowler must be able to predict what the bird will do and how it will do it, what its behavior will be in a certain setting. 
would you say with me, he knows my button to push? Oh, yes, he does. You didn't say it, but I know it's the truth. He knows what buttons to push in our life, doesn't he? Doesn't he? All of us. You know, sometimes they're seasonal buttons. Sometimes they're personality buttons. You know, I almost gave out buttons in the parking lot today just for you to actually put in your car and tape it to your dashboard and say, that button is not going to be pushed anymore. But you know what I started realizing? I needed all the buttons I had for me. Amen? Honestly, it's he knows. He knows what buttons to push. And in certain circumstances, in certain situations, he knows that if he brings that before you, lets you know about it, boom, it's a snare. Then his move is to kill, steal, and destroy. But he doesn't come out with a pitchfork and, and a long tail and a red suit right away. No, he does this first. He's a deceiver. He's the father of all lies. The truth has never been in him, Jesus said. So in other words, the fowler has to be able to predict what the bird will do in a certain setting. Once he knows that, then he knows what trap works the best. Are, are you with me? And he'll go to great lengths, not to be seen, not to be heard, not to be made aware of. Deception. Deception. Snares come in beautiful packages. Why? Because it, he's an angel of light. It can look good, smell good, sound good, talk good, and be the worst thing that could ever have been. Nothing but a snare. He's an angel of light. He's a great deceptor. And he's a trap setter. He sets the trap. Offense is a big one. In fact, the word offense is the Greek word skidalia. Scandalin, I'm sorry, scandalin. And the word scandalin is literally the tab that hangs down in a cage that lures the rabbit or the squirrel or the whatever, or the raccoon or whatever. It's, it's the lure. That's what offense is. Offense is a lure into the trap of Satan. It's a snare just like the ones we're talking about here. And, and, and he's a fowler because like bird catchers, this Satan's a fowler because like bird catchers, he uses great weight patience in knowing you. He watches. He's a lot more patient than we are. We sometimes have to have immediate results. You know, he watches, he sees the pattern. He sees what will get you, wh wh who it is, what it is, what's the situation that that button will go off. And he sets the trap. He knows when that button can be pushed by you. He knows our buttons. And it's critical to know that because it's how he is. He ensnares us. See, sometimes we don't even know the buttons, or we know them, but we fall for the same snare every single time. Ah, oh, but I'm just breathing a sigh of relief. I am so thankful, and I hope you are too, that we have a secret place. Church, we have a secret place. Do you see where these verses are starting to have a progression now? We have a secret place, and it's a place, can I just share with you with great excitement? It's a place he doesn't understand. Satan doesn't understand the secret place. He has no idea, none at all. It confuses the fowler when you pray in the middle of a storm. When you praise God in the middle of a storm, it confuses the fowler. It confuses the fowler when you pour kindness on evil. It confuses the fowler when you run to the throne instead of the phone. It confuses the fowler when we are in that secret place abiding and, and manifesting the word. He doesn't know what to do with that. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to, I think, you know, one of our ending points in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verses 6 to 8. And it says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. 
Jesus speaking to Nicodemus about a born-again experience. I'm sure you recognize these narratives. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. Verse 8 says, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but you cannot tell where it came from or where it goes. So, so is the case of everyone that's born again. So he's saying, what's born of the spirit is spirit, and what's born of flesh is flesh. Well, Jesus here, as we just said, is talking about being born again. He's, this is the correct interpretation of John 3. But I believe Jesus has applications we can learn from that portion of scripture. And I think what we're talking about today is one of them. When we're born of the spirit, we have the potential, church, catch this, don't miss it, to be unpredictable. Oh, I love that. I don't know about you. There's something really great when you're so predictable, you can be trusted. But you know what? When you walk with God, there's an element of unpredictability. Satan can't push unpredictable buttons. A Amen? So, so watch this. Don't miss it. Catch it. The devil can predict the flesh, but he cannot predict the spirit. He can predict the flesh. He knows those buttons. They're fleshly buttons. But he can't predict the spirit. Come on, somebody. You and I can be caught up in the wind of the Holy Ghost with such power that Satan don't know whether you're coming or going. Yeah. You're blessed when you come in and you're blessed when you go out. You're the head and not the tail. You're blessed in the city and blessed in the country. Above and not beneath. And hallelujah, blessed right smack in the middle of COVID-19. We surely can be delivered by the snare. By what? How? How can we be delivered by that? By the first two verses. By hiding in the secret place and speaking faith-filled words. Do you see where we're going here? Faith-filled words. Galatians 5 says, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let me give you the Pastor Deborah Grohler translation here of this. Walk in the spirit and the fowler won't foul things up. So when he finds someone to use, someone of walking in the flesh, he knows where the buttons are. So when, when something happens, when something comes across, listen, I'm preaching to myself today too. When something comes your way, and it's going to come our way because he wants to push our buttons. See, I should have gave out those buttons. I'm telling you, it was just the right message for buttons, and I have a lot of them. Yes. So, so what am I saying? When he finds someone to use, when he uses a principality or a power or a ruler in high places, don't say what you want to say to them. Okay? Instead, think to yourself, think to yourself, that's a snare down the path I'm not willing to go to. We got to be smarter. We got to be wiser. Satan always has to use a person to push your button. He's not going to show up and go, here I am. No, he uses people. That's what he uses. That's why Paul urges us so many times in scripture, don't walk in the flesh, walk in the spirit. And you know what he says? Don't try to just say, I'm not going to walk in the flesh. I'm not going to walk in the flesh. No, you know what he says? Just walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It'll come natural for us not to do that. Amen? So again, when, you, when, when he finds someone to push your button, don't say what you want to say to him. Instead, say, you know what? I am not going to go down that path of snares. Oh, you know what, Satan? I'm a bird, all right. But you know what kind of bird I am? I'm an eagle. And those that mount up with the wings of eagles walk and do not fade. They run and don't grow weary. Stop being out. I'm happy about that. I'm about ready to buy this tape myself. This is some good preaching. Stop hanging out with crows, chickens, and cuckoo birds. And listening to them for that matter. But just wait. 
Just wait, that's only the beginning of the blessing that we're going to read through the next 14 verses, okay? Because he says he'll deliver us also from perilous pestilence. Not just the snare of the fowler, but perilous pestilence. See, I looked up this word, and the word pestilence is the Hebrew word duber, and it means virulent, which is another word for contagious, infectious. It's a word for plagues, infectious diseases, which are deadly and devastating. Wait a minute, Pastor Debbie. Are you, you, you don't have the audacity to actually say Psalm 91 can deliver me from COVID-19. Oh, yes, I am saying that. Oh, yes, I am saying that. Yes, I am saying that. Well, there you go. And that's just not been my experience. Well, can I just say to you, don't get out of the cotton pick and boat because that wasn't your experience. Be willing to be humbled in the word of God and learn. And learn. I don't know why your experience was what it was. I have some experiences to myself. But I'm not going to throw the whole Bible out just because my experience didn't line up with the word. I can guarantee you one thing. Whatever went wrong, it wasn't God's wrong. This is the word. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Amen? And I have what it says I have. Are you going to believe it or not? Are you going to believe it or not? Or is your butt in the middle of truth? But, you know, B-U-T, not, you know. Yeah. Is your butt in the middle of truth? Is it? This is the Bible. This is the Bible. Are we going to believe the Bible even though it's difficult times? Even though it's perilous, pestilent times? You know what the psalmist Moses said? He confessed and kept confessing even if COVID-19 comes, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress in God in whom I trust. Well, Pastor Deb, what, what do you think about the vaccine? You know what I think about the vaccine? Don't release your faith in the snare of the fowler. I vaccinate you right now. I vaccinate you right now in the name of Jesus with Psalm 91. That's what I vaccinate you with right now. And all of you on Facebook too. Well, I don't know. That's just ridiculous. Well, go ahead and click off. Turn yourself over to the snare of the fowler. Surely, this is where we'll end. Surely he will deliver you from snares, traps, hidden dangers, viruses, pestilence, and all the power of the snare of the fowler. Surely. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I am so grateful for your word. I am so thankful that you place your word above your name. And you have a name above every name that is named. So we are totally covered. You have a name over COVID-19. And your word gives us the assurance that if we attend to it every day, and we keep it in our heart, we speak it out of our mouth, you said we would be prosperous and we would be successful. You actually said in Proverbs 4.20, it would be health to all of our flesh. So Lord, this week, this week, we take the inoculation, the vaccine of not just Psalm 91, but every other portion of the word of God that'll be medicine to our hearts. And Father, for Lord's sake, can we be a little merry? Because a merry heart does good like medicine. So Father, I just thank you for the joy of the Lord being our strength. I just thank you so much that, that these, your children, have saw fit in the middle of every Sunday afternoon for weeks and weeks and weeks to sit here, sometimes in hot cars, and, and, but want to be fed by you. And we truly do, Lord. 
we receive your word in this parking lot and for those that are watching online we receive 91 psalm the 91st psalm we receive that inoculation and lord we will we will guard our secret place and we will allow you to inspect our tongue every single day so we can have all the surelies in Psalm 91 that follow. And while your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's the first place where these benefits come to pass. David said, I will I bless the Lord at all times. He said, you know, that my soul, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not his benefits. See, these are benefits of those in the kingdom. If you're here in the parking lot, you're there watching online, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please, you got to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth. What? Admitting that every day you do something wrong, God calls that sin. Believing Jesus did something about that sin by dying on the cross for you. And what? Committing, but not just committing, confessing. So if you said that prayer, let's pray together. Father, I have fallen short of perfection, which is the, the, the measure that I must have to have a relationship with you. Jesus has made me, made me perfect through what, he, through what he did for me, dying for my sin and making me without spot, without blemish. And Father, I commit my life to you now. And I will tell somebody because you said in Romans 10, if we believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and we confess with our mouth, we will be saved. So tell somebody, believe in your heart, but also tell somebody. Amen. Well, that is our message for today. Praise the Lord. And if you need a Psalm 91 bookmark, they'll be here um, along with a place for you to place your offerings if you desire. Um, and also, I know that you got your Word for You Today book. If you um, did not receive that, you can also pick that up here. I love you. I'm your greatest cheerleader. We're going to get through this, and we're going to be better than we ever were before because life in the kingdom gets gooder and gooder. Amen? Have a great and wonderful week. Love you.